Welcome to a special edition of Schooling Around. Today we are focusing on a subject that would, one would think doesn't happen here, human trafficking. The definition of human trafficking is people in bondage through force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of sex or labor exploitation. Sadly enough, the fact is, it does happen here. The National Association of Attorneys General has created a program called Pillars of Hope to address this issue. One of its goals is public awareness and issue advocacy. That is why we are here today. I'll introduce our panel in a moment. Hi everybody, I'm Terry Stiles. And I'm Bill Service. I'm the producer of our Community Access. For nearly 10 years, Terry and I have been bringing our Community Access into your living rooms to keep you informed about what's happening in our communities. We've all had great fun at our community events such as Lone Ranger and Strawberry Festivals. We brought you natural wonders such as bees and ceremonies to bless them. We've kept you informed of election issues and how your votes affect all of us. And we've told you about our local artist important fundraisers that help the ones you love. We've helped you get to know our new business neighbors and much, much more. But we're not done yet. There's much more we plan to cover. So watch us weekdays on Charter Channel 191 and ATT Channel 99 at 9.30 at 1, then at 7 o'clock and Saturday at 9.30. See you there. Our panel today includes Special Agent Michael Glennon, Unit Supervisor of the Southeast Michigan Crimes Against Children Task Force, Sergeant Edward Price of the Michigan State Police Human Trafficking Division, Maggie Dunn, Maggie and her husband Jason established the House of Providence in Detroit, that's a therapeutic home for minors who are wards of the state, and more locally, Janet Schell, the Academic Supervisor of the Oxford Virtual Academy, and Denise Sweet, the Assistant Superintendent of Student Services for the Oxford School District. Thank you all for being here today. Michael, I think I'd like to start with you to get a, maybe a national and a state perspective on human trafficking and why it seems to a lot of people that we're all of a sudden paying attention to it. Uh, sure, John. As you indicated, um, it seems like human trafficking is in the news a lot. There's a lot of uh, people that are talking about it and putting a lot of emphasis in it. But as many of us know, the, um, the crime itself is not new, and the elements are not new at all. Um, the FBI has been taking a look at human trafficking for a number of years, um, and with many of our partners now, we've put a special emphasis, if you will, uh, probably over the last 10 to 12 years. Um, back in 2004, we created what was the Innocence Lost Initiative, and what it did was it focused in on several communities, cities, that were targets, target-rich environments for uh, women that were coming in, being prostituted, uh, sex slaves, and whatnot. And what they decided to do was uh, allow them the opportunity to combine forces and create task forces so that they could combat against these enterprises that were going against these individuals. So from there, um, the FBI has continued to grow uh, with our partnerships and our relationships. What we've seen increase over the probably the last several years was for us specifically, as, as you had indicated, human trafficking is kind of defined as the force, fraud, and coercion uh, of an individual. Mm -hmm. And it can include a myriad of different elements. It could be labor trafficking. It could be uh, sex trafficking. It, it can involve anything that has those three elements. So what we've done here locally is we've combined our uh, Violent Crimes Against Children unit and sex trafficking unit with our human trafficking unit. So we've put all those together so that we're more on the board um, with our law enforcement partners, such as the state police, to make sure that we can combat and have a team that's available to, to handle everything. Um, and I know that Ed can probably speak a little bit more uh, on behalf of some of the things that the state has been doing over the last few years as well. Sure, Ed, we're glad to have you with us. Please nice to be here. continue. Um, in terms of Michigan State Police um, and tackling human trafficking, it would have started with us probably about 2005 when we partnered with the FBI and then the task force started in 2007 where we partnered with our local partners of the area. The Detroit metropolitan area was in one of the, picked as one of the top 10 cities as a uh, recruitment or destination area. I know people think about human trafficking, they think about prostitution, they think it is a inner city issue or problem. I'm here to tell you it's not. Um, as a task force, we spend most of our time actually out in the suburbs, 
out in Oakland County in um, Western Wayne County um, investigating these cases. So we have partnered with the FBI, FBI here. We've also partnered with the FBI over in Grand Rapids and Bay City to these task forces to address this problem. Um, of course, we investigate the adult part of it, but we also investigate the children, um, sex trafficking, which you don't necessarily need force, fraud, or coercion. If that person is under the age of 18, it's automatically human trafficking, so you don't even need to prove those different elements. I heard some numbers not too long ago that there's more so-called slaves in the, in the trafficking business today than there was in, in, in all of our history through the Civil War and during the early years. Have you ever heard that? I've heard a lot of different stats being thrown out. I think one of the issues that, or problems, we'll say that we have here in Michigan is the true data collection on terms of how many victims are here. And I know I'm part of the Michigan Human Trafficking Commission, and that's one of our subcommittees, is to address that issue with the data collection um, in terms of showing how many victims we truly have. I know they've, they've been some outrageous numbers that I've seen here, which I know um, isn't true. Um, one of the things I've seen pushed out is that Michigan is number two in terms of human trafficking. Um, After and, Nevada, is that right? Right, but that is the false um, stat that went out. We were number two in the operation that we call Operation Cross Country. It's part of the Innocence Loss Program, where all the task forces nationwide go out and we attempt to recover child victims or adult victims in prostitution. Well, for that one, we'll say, raid or that one situation, Detroit area or Michigan, we are ranked number two because we recovered 10 juveniles that were involved with sex trafficking and arrested about 18 pimps. So for that four-day period, we were number two just because we were out actively doing undercover stings. Mm -hmm. But we are not number two in Michigan for human trafficking as far as, as a whole. As far as keeping stats go, it's not exactly the kind of thing where you can circulate a form to fill out or ask people to raise their hands, is it? A little no, more difficult than No, that. it's not. Um, that's one of the issues we're trying to address even with training with local law enforcement um, because there's so many different elements to the human trafficking. A lot of times these exploiters might be arrested for felonious assault or domestic violence. So that's how it's coded in the system world. In actuality, that was a pimp or a trafficker who was assaulting a victim, but it's not being reported properly. If you go online to YouTube and you pull up human trafficking and watch some of the videos, you'll find that a lot of those videos are centered on our southern border with Mexico. But here we are next to Canada. What does that have to do with this particular problem? Well, I think the international borders, um, it, like you said, it, it depends on the violation it is. Uh, human trafficking is such a broad entity in and within itself. So alien smuggling and, and many of the things that go and coincide with that from the labor perspective or some of the um, uh, other elements of human trafficking, international borders will, will contribute to that. Um, so from here, our perspective is we have that international border, but then we also have the sex slave or the sex trade sure. that's going on. Um, and where we're specifically located within the country is kind of a thoroughway, if you will, the I-75 corridor not far off from Chicago and, and kind of from the west to the east coast, kind of the middle, middle ground, if you will. Um, a lot of people end up coming through Detroit. Um, so. Well, there's a, there's a lot of important events that take sure. place. And wherever you have important events, I would think that would draw something like this. Is that what you find? We do. So on a given, kind of on a statistical standpoint, within Southeast Michigan, we have approximately, I think it's uh, one advertisement every two minutes that's being posted on some of the um, prostitution websites, such as Backpage. So that translates to, I think, about 168 ads per day during the peak hours. So that number increases about 30 to 40 percent when you have a major event, such as a World Series, such as the auto show, mm -hmm. or something to that event that happens throughout that period. So uh, you definitely see an influx of the sex trade that's going on. Now, of that element, how much is involved in human trafficking, it's unknown. Mm -hmm. um, hence, that's the reason we do a number of the operations that we do during those time periods as well. Can you give me a feel for 
what is being done to educate the local police departments and sheriff's departments about this sort of thing and you know teaching them what to look for and how to handle some of this yeah we have a, an aggressive training program and i'll let ed probably speak a little bit more on that because it, he does a lot of the training um, but from a national perspective we've created a uh, uh, a syllabus, if you will, and a training uh, program which focuses uh, and, and empowers many of the first responders that are on the front lines out there how to identify human trafficking, mm -hmm. what are the elements, how to recognize it, what to do, and kind of rethink their perspective. That, And it's a, a video program, Ed was actually in it, and uh, it helps them to kind of retool maybe some of the things that they've been trained over the years. and maybe re-identify that and, and, and maybe just put something in the back of their mind that maybe this is human trafficking. Um, and I think Ed might want to speak a little bit more on that. Sure, Ed, go ahead. Yep, just to piggyback on what Mike said, as part of that training program is one of the things we're looking at on the commission here in Michigan is to push that out for all law enforcement here statewide um, to cover your road officers and then do more of a advanced training program for your detectives and for your investigators. Um, which one of those steps was a partnership that we had with the Michigan State Police as well as the FBI Behavioral Analysis Unit where a investigative guide was created by experts throughout the United States um, which breaks down for law enforcement how to investigate these crimes because they're so complex and they're so vi victim-centered in terms of how you conduct a proper investigation. Um, so that's being done, as well as the Michigan State Police were in a process of putting together a awareness program for the general public that all of our community service troops will have and be able to go out to all their different communities, town hall meetings, um, to the schools to bring the awareness on um, the different resources that are currently in their area to get help when they do come across the victims. That was going to be my next question, the schools, since that's kind of the focus of my job. It would seem logical to me that some training would be given to counselors and folks like that to recognize clues of certain things going on. Is there going to be anything handed down that would help to facilitate that? Yes, that's one of the things that's being done. Um, we have done trainings in different schools throughout the uh, metropolitan uh, Detroit area. Um, is up to Flint as well. We've done some trainings up there um, for their school boards, for their counselors, for their teachers. Um, so that's something that we're looking to expand and grow as an agency as well as a uh, task force to get into the schools more. But it uh -huh. is being done currently. We also have Denise Sweet with us. Uh, she's the Assistant Superintendent of Human Services. And Denise, would you enlighten us a little bit on, on some of the requirements that your folks have to go through to try and make sure that the right kids are with the right family and so forth? So um, to enroll in Oxford Community Schools, um, it, it requires a parent or legal guardian. Um, that parent or legal guardian has to have a current pictured identification. Um, they have to provide us with two proofs of residency. Um, if there's any type of um, divorce or any legal documents, they have to provide that as well. Um, they have to provide us with the students or with their child's um, um, original birth certificate. So we have to see that original birth certificate as well. So those are the, the requirements to enroll. In the society we're living in where divorce seems to be so, so prominent and, and couples breaking up and kids being passed along to their grandparents, do you run into this a lot where maybe the documents aren't there and they have to go back and fix things or? Well, they, they are required to provide those legal documents. So um, sometimes we may see where um, a grandmother is caring for the child, but um, they're not the legal guardian. They cannot enroll. So then they have to go back through the court system and become the legal guardian um, of that child. Um, so we see situations like that. Just as a general question, have you, have you seen any situations where you, your folks even began to suspect human trafficking in our school district? Not necessarily um, upon enrollment. Um, oftentimes we don't even meet the child. It's the parent coming in and enrolling. Mm -hmm. So sometimes those, uh, the, the people that are having the first um, interactions with the student are the counselor or the teacher, the social worker um, out in the school. Okay, we're going to take a little break and then we're going to come back and talk to Maggie Dunn.
Hi there, it's Connie Miller from Connie's Kitchen here at Treetop Lodge on OCTV here in Oxford and on YouTube. I want you to come on back and, and enjoy the show. We've got a lot of episodes coming up and a lot of new stuff running and we're doing all sorts of different things. We're grilling and everything else here at the lodge. We're busy, busy, so come on back. I want to see you soon. Thank you. We're very happy to have Maggie done with us from the House of Providence in Detroit. She has a special connection with Oxford because the Oxford Virtual Academy provides uh, the educational tunnel to the girls in your program. Yes. You see the results of a lot of this down there, don't you? Yes. Could you just give us a clue of some of the things you see and what just overwhelms you about all of this? Yeah, we see many direct correlations between the foster care system and human trafficking. We see generational um, kids who are in the system because their mothers are victims and find themselves languishing in the system now. We have, I would say, well over half of our residents, uh, past and present, are victims of trafficking. Um, some are already branded by a pimp. We have girls who um, their moms have given them to pimps for drugs. We have, um, we see it on many, many levels, m multifaceted. And so what we try to do is um, stabilize the youth when they come to us and then really work on um, just reestablishing a, a new mindset and bringing uh, mental health truly to someone who has been so exploited and so, um, you know, just pulled apart bit piece by piece as a, a human being. And so um, certainly education is a huge piece of that and giving the girls what, what alternatives is the, what for is their the future. age group of kids that you see? Nine to 17 is what we are licensed through the state of Michigan to um, house. And we, our program is set up in such a way that they are not required to leave at any certain age, we want to see a real viable plan for them of where they go next. And aging out, in our view, is not a viable plan. Emancipation is not a viable plan. Um, everybody needs a family. There's no age limit on when you're old enough, you don't need a family now. I don't agree with that. Tell me how these girls come to you. How do you find these girls? Uh, we receive referrals through the Department of Health and Human Services, and we also receive private referrals that we then take through uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. And you help provide schooling for them as well. I mean, it's not just taking them in and providing housing, but schooling is part of this as well. Correct. Yeah, and maybe we could uh, bring Janet Shell into the picture here to just kind of tell us how that works with the Virtual Academy had a wonderful partnership with the House of Providence. Um, because we are a school of choice district, it's been a wonderful way to provide an avenue for girls who have not had stability. So if they haven't had stability in the home and their family, for even if it's generational, you see that in, that in their educational experience. So many of them come in without um, many tools at all, a lot of gaps. And so where virtual education has come into play is that we're able to bring a girl in to test them. They, they take a diagnostic online reading and math test and it helps us gauge where they are because it's difficult to place a, a girl that maybe is reading at a third or fourth grade level in world history. If, so now we have some tools and we're able to customize the, the vendor program, the teachers are aware then that they need more help, chunking, um, different ways that we can come at their education with knowing their background um, so that we can set them up for success and not the failure um, to throw them into a, a classroom. Very often they don't even have the skill set yet, the emotional ability to even function in a classroom, a traditional classroom. So this is providing a way for these young ladies to be at the House of Providence to receive all that nurturing care and then be able to enter the educational world again and not lose credits. And because um, we all know education, I mean, everybody says it, it's kind of blase, but education is, the, is yeah. their hope. It's, it's empowerment to, to all students, but especially young women, they need yeah. to be educated to change their lives, to have those tools that they need to go on and, be, you yeah. know, break out of this cycle, poverty and 
And it's been a wonderful partnership. When you're taking someone from such extreme abuse mm -hmm. and neglect, you have to remove as many of the chaotic variables that normal teens can just maneuver through, but you have to remove as many of those as possible yeah. in order to stabilize and then reestablish some ego strength so that they can find some success. And foster care is a really great indicator. Aging out of foster care is a great indicator that someone will end up trafficked or in prostitution because if my daughter goes missing or one of our daughters goes missing, we are going to be on the news, we're going to rally our friends, we're going to have an Amber Alert and all of those type of things. And, and pimps really count on the fact that no one looks for them. When foster children go missing, no one cares, no one looks for them. And that is something that pimps really count on. Obviously, your girls come from extraordinary circumstances. Do you find yourselves in a situation where you're looking over your shoulder a lot? We have had situations where we have had pimp circle our building and that kind of thing, um, but we we just keep, uh, it's not for the faint of heart, let's say that. It's mm -hmm. certainly, and I'm not a shrinking violet, and mm -hmm. you get in there, and I know this is my life assignment, and I do it with everything I have. Yeah. And how many girls do you have down there? Ten. Now? Ten girls. Mm -hmm. yeah. Janet, I'm going to bring you back into the picture just for a moment. You know, a lot of people have preconceived notions of what virtual ed is, or, and including me, till I got together and talked with all you folks over there. But there could be a connection here between virtual ed and human trafficking, a way of, of maybe sensing something unusual going on, couldn't there? Absolutely. Yeah, in, in, in interaction, I mean, you could, you could have a student and a lot of times they will open up more in this environment because it feels like social media to them. It feels like maybe they're chattering on Twitter or Facebook yeah. and they open up about a situation and, and then, you know, we're reporters, so we would take that through to our student services and on up. But it definitely is a um, an environment where students feel much more freely to about speaking about personal things in their lives, so for sure. We're going to listen to a real live victim of human trafficking in just a moment. We'll be right back. Hi everyone, I'm Julie Hogan, host of a new show called Let's Get Strolling. And what I do is I interview local businesses and interesting and fun people, sometimes event planners, sometimes the residents of Oxford, maybe next time it could be you. Join me next time on OCTV on Let's Get Strolling. It's easy for us to talk about encouraging young women caught up in this to break loose and turn in their handlers. Last April, the Metro Detroit chapter of the U.S. National Committee for UN Women, located in Rochester Hills, put on a conference. It was called Not in My Backyard, Conquering Human Trafficking in Michigan. After the panel discussion, a young woman in the audience, Bridget, stood up and said this. Just a warning, the language is a bit tough. Let's have a look. I stand here today, should I recall the time that he headbutted me in my face and broke my nose? Should I recall the time that he used me as a human batting ram into the side of a vehicle to where I passed out? Should I recall the time that when I told him I didn't want to do it anymore, he chased me down the street and beat me and dragged me back by my hair into the house to continue to beat me? Then ultimately yelled and screamed and told me I wasn't nothing but a useless asshole when I owed him. I'm standing here today to take a stand for the women, not only for myself, but for the women that are involved, the other victims involved in my case. Just not just me. I'm standing here today to raise my voice for all the women that have fallen through cracks. Mm -hmm. I have been told by particular people and certain entities, and I won't name any names just for their privacy, I'm sorry we have failed you. By a show of hands, can anybody in here raise their hand and tell me what it's like to be afraid to go to sleep because you're afraid of your nightmares? Mm -hmm. I've advocated for myself for the past two and a half years. 
trying to get justice, trying to get closure. And it's brought me to this point that I'm here today, crying out for the help. When I called people, please, begging, crying on the phone, when is this going to end? I get told I'm having a bad day. Eight and a half years of my life is it a bad day. There's not even a word for a bad day for me. And as you walk out of this building today, I just want you to think and walk in my shoes for a brief moment and as you walk to your vehicles and you have to scan the parking lot to see if your traffickers followed you here today. And if today may be the last day you even speak or see anybody. I'm fighting for myself. I'm fighting for the other women. Yes, there are laws in place, but none of those laws protect us. You can go to our website, occtv.org, then to programs, and then to outside productions to see this entire conference. It's worth a watch. Any comments on this from you folks? We didn't figure out who's going to talk first. Oh, go ahead, Ed. You know, I, th I think what the community as a whole um, needs to realize is that to investigate these crimes properly, you have to take a victim-centered approach, um, which is what we do as a task force, um, and that's has helped us become as successful as we are. Um, some of these cases, they do take time uh, to investigate. There are different tools um, you might need to track down um, in terms of to get that trafficker or to have enough probable cause to arrest them. It could be phone records, it could be internet records, emails, different things of that nature. I can't say from after seeing this clip, I can't say that that exploiter or that pimp um, has been arrested. Um, he has been charged by the Michigan Attorney General's office, um, so he is not on the street anymore victimizing anyone. Well, that, that lady was certainly in the right place at the right time with our Attorney General Bill Schuette there because after she was done speaking, they all invited her to come up afterwards so they could, they could settle the issue. So I'm glad to hear that. What about from the FBI level? What's, what, is it tough to prove? some of this stuff? I think proving isn't the issue. I think what, um, what we have seen is just, first of all, getting people to report it. And um, you know, it starts at the bottom of uh, individuals that may have seen it, getting them to report it to the proper authorities, getting the locals to identify it and get it to people that are the experts in the field to be able to handle it properly. And, you know, and so just getting the word of mouth out there so that uh, individuals that are involved in it um, can realize that there are teams such as our group and, and the groups that we have right here that, that really want to help them, that take that victim-centered approach, that really want to help them get their life back and, and really hold the people responsible um, for what they've been doing, and in this case for well over eight years. Um, and so that's what we've, we're committed to, and I think that's what we want to get out there. Mm -hmm. Maggie, what did you think about that? You must see a lot of fear. Absolutely, and I think it's important to have a, uh, a future-centered approach with them and, and to get involved with organizations that are assisting. And I think um, more than anything, it's, you know, I, the easy way is to sort of write a check and, and give some money, but to actually get involved, it gets messy to have relationships and walk the journey of healing and freedom with each victim. And so getting involved in an organization on any level that you can to mentor, to tutor with the Virtual Academy. We use um, tutors all the time, mentors, people who are going to help broaden their life experience, give them more tastes of success than they have ever known, and thereby increasing that ego strength so that they believe that they were not part of the problem, but they were truly a victim. It must be tough to get them to talk about some of this stuff. Um, it's really not as tough as you would think. Once they really know they're somewhere safe and that people are consistent and you care, and just showing up every day proves a lot mm -hmm. to them, and showing up on the good days and showing up on the bad days and not being ill-affected by those bad days in terms of your relationship with them and, and that it's okay with us if you're not okay. What is your biggest challenge down there? Um, our biggest challenge is... Um, engaging the community and rallying people to actually open their homes and to be a family for these these kids who desperately need a family that's our biggest challenge is finding homes any other comments on that film clip that we showed 
kind of takes your breath away, doesn't it? Yeah. Our Governor Rick Snyder has written, human trafficking is a crime that depends on our ignorance. It thrives on its hidden nature. Education and awareness are important, but we must go beyond that. The high price of human trafficking demands that each and every one of us pull it from the shadows to convict the criminals and aid the victims. There is a number that you can call if you suspect human trafficking. It is to the National Human Trafficking Resource Center, and that number is 1-888-373-7888. Or you can text BE FREE or 233-733. We thank our panel, Special Agent Michael Glennon of the FBI, Ed Price of the Michigan Split State Police Trafficking Division, Human Trafficking Division, Maggie Dunn from the House of Providence, Janet Schell from the Oxford Virtual Academy, and Denise Sweet, Oxford's Assistant Superintendent of Student Services. And we thank you for watching. This is Oxford Community Television, keeping it local. You're watching OCTV, Oxford Community Television, serving Oxford, Addison Township, and the village of Leonard.